Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is James Altucher. He is famously good at starting companies and selling them, but at his core, he is a writer. He's done all kinds of things in his life. He has a BS in computer science from Cornell. He started his career working in IT for HBO and eventually hosted a show there. He founded Reset Inc. and sold it. He wrote about stocks for Jim Cramer and became a hedge fund manager. He founded the website Stock Picker and sold it. He was a seed investor in Buddy Media, which was acquired by Salesforce for $745 million. So he's not hurting for money. He's a chess master, a speaker, and now a stand-up comedian, and he really is getting after it. But he's been blogging since blogging was a thing. He's written 20 books, and he's been hosting the James Altucher Show for years, on which he helps all of us make sense of the habits and traits of the world's top performers and most interesting people. Well, it takes one to know one. Pete and I are both big fans of his. You can link to all of his content on jamesaltucher.com, and you are absolutely going to love him. Here's James Altucher. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> this is James Altucher, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. James Altucher is an author, a podcaster, an angel investor, a chess master. He's even taken to the stage as a stand-up comedian. He's the face and the proprietor of Choose Yourself Media, where he's dedicated to curating the experiences and practices of the world's top performers in practically every interesting field. He shares that information with us on jamesaltucher.com, and you should go there and read, listen, subscribe, soak up everything to make yourself and, and your experience better. His latest book, I think it's your latest book, is called Reinvent Yourself, something he's clearly done many times, does over and over again, and it certainly gets our attention. And James, thank you for joining us. We're elated, man. Thank you for inviting me onto the show. I'm so happy to be here. Hey, so I, I know, uh, you know, you met my girlfriend, and she always follows you, and that's how I, I keep up with what you're doing. But uh, she said that you've had a bit of a tough week, man. Are you all right? Oh, yeah. I wonder why she said that. Uh, I'm trying to think. Maybe because you published uh, your phone number? What was that about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. No, that was an interview that uh, somebody did with me, and they said, what's the weirdest text I ever had? But that was a text I got okay. years ago. So somebody somebody wrote, sent me a text saying uh, that I had implanted electronic chips into his brain and I was controlling him using top secret CIA Zionist technology. And why wasn't I using my platform to write about this? So that was probably the weirdest text I ever I'm not got. sure whether he was troubled because you were spying on him or whether he was bothered that you didn't write about him because you didn't find him that interesting yeah well if you go to his website i won't say what the website is but if you go to his website it's really he's got post after post about me controlling him so it's a little it's a little disturbing okay so the thing that fascinates us about you is that you've done a lot of just crazy stuff that we can tell you're doing as an experiment for yourself It's not like, hey, I'm going to do this. This will be a great publicity stunt. This will get a lot of attention Um, because. Yeah, I never I never really do it. If you do something as like a stunt, it's almost guaranteed to fail. But if you do something because you have vision behind it and you really want to explore some aspect of life that is making you curious or, or you think will make you better, then you have opportunity to learn from it. And there's many ways to express it and be creative around it and that's and that's what people pay attention to because because usually you're exploring something that other people want to explore as well and and that's interesting so one of the things that you did that really caught our attention uh is um a couple years ago you spent uh many months what maybe a year and a half with just 15 belongings in your life three years three Three years. years you did that yeah wow yeah just just stopped it really like well a year and ago. to punctuate your point uh, you did that for you and you did that for the sake of the experiment because 
you got hit up by practically everybody who wanted to make a movie about it, and you turned them all down. Yeah, I mean, everybody was trying. Well, first off, the New York Times ran this profile, and then suddenly I was getting calls from all over the entertainment industry, people wanting to do TV shows, do movies. And I thought about it. Like, I thought of different ideas. I wasn't 100% against it. But it just, A, it just seemed like a lot of work. And B, you know, there are people who are real minimalists, like homeless people, who really only have 15 belongings. And I don't know. I didn't really think I was more interesting than those people. I just wanted to... I wanted to I needed to do this for myself and not, you know, try to try to benefit from it in any way. It was just something I was doing for me. And what was the for you experience that you you I know I'm asking you to encapsulate 3 years of living like a vagabond and you probably learned a ton of things, but if you could cook it down to something that we can all take with us, just some proverb for us and our listeners. Uh what is it you think you learned? Yeah, I I mean, I learned that I didn't really need anything. So I could basically live in any situation with no belongings. You know, everybody everybody says, oh, you know, like the Marie Kondo method, keep the objects you love. And I, I realized I didn't really, I don't know what that means. I didn't really need to love any objects. Like I love humans and I use objects but much better to do that than to love objects and use yeah. humans. So I, 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 I learned that I could basically, like I remember one time, Airbnb, of course, heard about what I was doing. Was, I was only living in Airbnbs. I wasn't renting a home or owning a home because when you live in an Airbnb, you get all these items along with the Airbnb, like towels and dishes and sheets. So I didn't really need anything other than my clothes and a computer and a phone. And I would read books on the Kindle reader app on my phone. And so uh, I, I basically learned that whenever there was like I passed by a store or even a bookstore or a clothing store, I said, oh, I like that shirt. I want it. I controlled the impulse to just go in and buy it. And it wasn't a big deal. I didn't really need to buy anything. Now, of course, I was spending money. I was renting Airbnbs. It's not like I was living in the street and I was ordering food. I would never go grocery shopping either. I didn't, I didn't want to do, do go grocery shopping at all. So I would always order delivery or I would eat out. And so those were the only two things I spent money on. And I didn't, I didn't really travel. Like people think, Oh, it must be cool. You could travel all around the world. Airbnb. I didn't really travel much. I mean, I went to LA once maybe or twice. Uh, but I most of the time stayed in New York city and just moved around New York city. So I didn't travel that much. And I didn't really spend that much money other than the Airbnbs. Um, but but I would also say that people would say, oh, you must have felt really free and you must have felt really happy. Not really. Like, I think when you have a home, that also has a kind of freedom with it. Like, you're, you're free to not constantly be looking for where you're going to live next. And I wasn't necessarily happier. Just, like, I threw away some things that I missed and so that gave me a melancholy kind of feeling, which is not necessarily a negative feeling, but it's just it's different from happiness. So it was just it was just a different kind of feeling. Like it was a feeling that I didn't really need anything. And, I, and, I, and it's a dis even though now I live in an apartment and I've been accumulating things again, like like books. It's not like I, I it, it gave me a discipline where I feel like I don't really have to buy anything. There's nothing I actually really need to to have in order for my life to be better. That is terrific. I don't think everybody's emotionally prepared to get to go to that to that experience, and I think that you uh, illustrate that one of the things that allowed you to do it was that you you prepared yourself, or you had circumstances that prepared you to to do it emotionally because you're describing a way of looking at things like, Oh, I had belongings that meant something to me and, and I'm melancholy about it. But I know that some people would lose their minds if they had, you know, mementos and stuff that they no longer had. So, well, well think about people who let's say experience tragically like a fire, their, their house burns down and they lose family photos and heirlooms and things like that. You know, they're sad about it, but then they get over it. Like, you know, 
I can just say this from personal experience, but also science has shown that if something negative happens to you, chances are within a few months or, or a year or a few years, you bounce back to the same level of happiness or unhappiness that you had before you lost everything. So uh, I, I kind of knew that for me, and, and it's not necessarily a positive thing. Like I said to myself, it's not like I said, boy, I want a life of freedom. So I'm just going to throw everything out. There were some negative aspects too. Like I really, uh, I didn't want to, I, I have a hard time dealing with lots of paperwork and items. So I had a lease ending in an apartment and, uh, you know, a rental. And I didn't want to deal with, you know, putting all my belongings in storage and all the paperwork and renting a new place, which is in New York City to even rent an apartment. You need like six re personal references, a reference from your account, a reference from your lawyer. You got to take photographs of bank statements. You got to send in your IRS statements. You got to get approval of a board. It was just a drag. So I figured, you know what? I cannot like physically, mentally deal with this. And the only solution to not dealing with it was to throw everything out and live in Airbnbs because you can't carry all your stuff around to Airbnbs. I would just have a carry-on bag that I would take to Airbnbs. And when I woke up every day, I would take my bag with me. So it was as if I never even, as if I didn't live anywhere. Uh, like it just wherever I was, was, was where I lived. Oh my. I, went, I remember I went on the stage at the Airbnb conference. They have this annual conference. I went on the stage with my with my bag and I said I'm I just moved onto this stage right now <laughs> and it was true I didn't have any place to go that night and I I was just living on that stage that was that just moment. as much where you lived as wherever you were the night before yeah except there was no toilet so I would have to shit on the stage if I really needed to go yeah. to the bathroom <laughs> let's talk about reinvent yourself because I think it's your most recent book right but it's from the year before last yeah, actually, I've written a couple of books that I haven't put on Amazon yet. Uh, one's called The Side Hustle Bible, which is about side hustles you could do from home. Another one's called, I haven't released this one at all yet, but it's called Think Like a Billionaire. And it's about, you know, I've interviewed a couple dozen billionaires on my podcast, so I kind of summarize the results. But Reinvent Yourself, I would say, is the last kind of, you know, big book that I've published. It hits home for both uh Pete and for me because we are we're right around the same age as you and constantly just having to reinvent ourselves to keep up. Well, tell me how what are your last couple of reinventions? Uh, I'm currently yeah I mean we're doing this podcast. I'm uh, also writing and producing an audio drama. Uh, currently for money, I'm running a construction company. Um, as recently as two years ago, as a private investigator. And uh, whoa, yeah. wait, wait a second. What what were you doing as a private well, investigator? Well, you know, I had owned a martial arts studio with a, a friend of mine who was a, a cop. And when he retired from the police force, he said, hey, I want to uh, open up a private detective agency. And I said, wow, that sounds exciting. And he said, I was hoping you'd say that. Um, and he roped me in because, you know, we had been business partners before. So he said, just, you know, it's just us being business partners, except, um, you know, you get to carry a gun. And I was like, okay. That sounds like fun. So we did that, and we... Do you get to carry a gun just because you're a private well, investigator? Well, you know, I, I suppose you could be a private investigator and not carry one, but why would you do that? It sounds like more fun. But how can you legally run do around that? Like, like, like Thomas it's got to be hard. Uh, you know, it's a permitting process like everything else, but uh -huh. um, but you but you can. You can, and you, uh, you know, in, in the worlds that we were running around in, because we did a whole lot of uh, investigating of criminal cases, so... You know, we found ourselves in some pretty nasty spots where... Wait, wait, how would you get a case? And then what were some of the nasty <laughs> well, spots? Well, we would get cases from our clients were attorneys. And so our, our attorneys would say, I have a new client. His name is such and such. And he's uh, going to trial for murder. So you have to go talk to all of his friends. And sometimes when you knock on the doors of friends who are facing murder charges... Uh, they're not used to getting their door knocked on. And especially when you look like me and not them, they, um, they're they a little less welcoming sometimes. And so we would find ourselves in those positions. And, and my friend, who was my partner, he looks like a cop. 
I mean, he was a cop for, you know, he was a cop for 20 something years. And when you look, you take one look at that guy and you go, oh, here comes a cop. So, yeah, we would find ourselves in those places. So reinventing. And like, were, were, were any, did, it, did you change the outcome of any murder cases? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we did, we did have some fun things, but I'm not going to tell you about them on, on the air because I'm uh, developing an audio drama based on that experience. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. And so, look, you, you know, and what did you get your degree I in? I didn't. Never finished college. Pete's got <laughs> degrees, though. Okay, so you never finished He's college. Than I am. You've, you, <laughs> you, 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 you've never finished college. You, you've owned businesses. Yep. You've, you've, you've run different businesses. Construction company, private detective agency, audio yep. drama. You know... That's just part of life. And people, for a small period of history, that wasn't part of life. You would major in botany right. and you would become a gardener or a florist. And that's what you would do for your life. Or you would major in optical engineering and work in some kind of factory. And that's what you do for your whole life. But that was just like a small period of history. But the reality is people want to do many things We're we're kind of nomadic creatures and that just mean that doesn't mean just being a nomad in where you live but it also means being a nomad in what you do and and how you think and at different times in our life we're interested in different things when we're in our 20s maybe we want to be a race car driver when we're in our 30s maybe we want to be a stockbroker or a day trader or a real estate agent or buy real estate when we're, when we're in our 40s maybe we secretly want to be a, a baseball game announcer when we're in our 50s I don't know. I want to just watch TV a lot. <laughs> like you, you want to settle down at some point and, and, and your life changes and your motives change and, and your inspirations change. Well, just so our listeners can can uh, relate to you, I want to point out for those who know less about you that you've started uh, 20 businesses and 17 of them have failed. Uh, and you've written a lot of books that are great and a lot of books that were not great on the way to those great books. So yeah. for those of us who are still banging around trying to figure things out and doing things and failing at things, um, I find it inspiring. And I think that most of us who follow you find it inspiring that there is uh, light at the end of the tunnel and that it's not true that it's necessarily light at the end of the tunnel, but there are lights along the tunnel. Yeah, I mean, first off, every time you start something you you love – you're going to suck at it almost by definition because you love it. So you re you reason you love it is because it's worthy of loving and me meaning it should be difficult. It should be, it should be hard to achieve mastery in. That means you see the people who have achieved mastery in it and you see the difference because you love something, you see the nuances and, and you see the difference between the masters in what you love and where you are. So you suck in the beginning whether it's the, being a writer or a podcaster or probably a private investigator, you 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 see your mistakes, and kind you know, and there's no real goal. It's not like you're going to be, as an example, the the best private investigator in the world. There's no such thing. There, there's no the only goal is to kind of improve. Is to kind of make. Is to kind of take pleasure from the process of learning and improving. Um, because it's very rare in life that one gets to be the best in the universe at anything. And I, I think it, it's not that you reinvent yourself to some other goal. Reinvention itself is a pleasure. And, and that skill, the skill of reinvention is, is, is a pleasure. And, and that skill is something worth learning. So it's like meta learning the skill of reinvention makes whatever you're reinventing towards even more fun and interesting and, and quicker. So, you know, uh, 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 in the reinventions that I've done, I mean, I've been, you know, I, I, st I started off as a software engineer, then I got into the entertainment industry, then I got into the, the, the way I built a web a agency in the 90s. So then suddenly now I'm an entrepreneur, then I became a day trader, then a hedge fund manager. So suddenly I, would, I was from, went from, Software to entertainment to entrepreneurship to f investing in stocks to investing in other things, uh, and then I was a, 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 a I've been a writer for o the whole time, pretty over much. That's kind years. of been your through line. Yeah, writing's probably been the most consistent thing all throughout. Uh, but I've been a podcaster. I, I still am, and uh, and 
you know, Pete just saw me do stand-up comedy. I've been doing stand-up comedy for, for four years. Uh, I've been a public speaker for almost 20. Uh, I, I, you know, when I was a kid, I was a chess master, which is a hard skill to learn. But again, I couldn't be the world champion. I would have to uh, settle, quote unquote, with being just a master at it. And you could either enjoy that or you can say, oh, I, this is, I'm depressed. I'm never going to be the best in the world at an incredibly difficult thing. And, you know, it's, it's, what, it, it's what you make of it. It's why it's good to diversify the things you're good at. And, you know, you, you meet people along the way in all the different subcultures. Like when I go to California, when I go to L.A., for instance, I can hang out with the chess players I know. I can hang out with the comedians I know. I can hang out with the business people I know. I can hang out with the venture capitalists I know. And so, you, you, you know, by reinventing yourself, there's not only skills you learn, there's also different so subcultures that you can socially interact with, and that's a pleasure as well. So you've been all of these things, all these disparate things, and built yourself into who you are now. I I'm curious if if that's who you are, you're sort of this, um, I don't know, personal adventurer. You don't got to go to the South Pole, but you want to try stand-up comedy. You want to try, you know, this different thing. And, and you're not necessarily... Like, I, I'm very similar in my, my life where I want to try new things and learn new things and get to the point of mastery or whatever it's going to be. But it seems like um, I like to have a good bit of miscomfort where I'm doing something that other people do that I think this looks interesting. And that's how I expand my horizons. How would you characterize that for you? Well, I think I think it's. Yes, there's 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 an element of discomfort when you're trying something new. Like it's sort of pointless if it's easy. Like for instance, I can say I can wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm going to be the best tic tac toe player in the world. Sort of pointless. Like what's the point of that? Uh, but if there's something that scares me, like a, a classic example is something like stand up comedy, where many people are terrified to go up on stage and tell jokes to a room of 20 strangers. And there's no real reason to be terrified of that. It's just so that we are. It's like almost like this primal thing. And so to overcome that fear was not a pleasant experience. In fact, often it's a, an incredibly unpleasant experience to this day. Um, but there's a pleasure in knowing that I could do it or I could or I could start the process and get better. And again, like I say, there's a, a skill to reinventing. There's not just a skill to comedy or a skill to business. There's a skill to learning uh, like a like a meta skill. And I like that. I like engaging in that meta skill. I like in, I like picking something that has a very steep learning curve, starting at the bottom of that curve and feeling the joy of moving up that curve. And that for me is, 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 is pleasurable, even if there's very unpleasurable parts along the way. One of my favorite uh, ways to articulate that experience is uh, Stephen Rinella. Uh, he's a writer and a hunter and a glorious writer. He's got a show called Meat Eater. He just goes out and hunts things. And sometimes he spends four days out in the woods um, looking at a moose and never getting a shot at it. And coming home empty-handed, and what he describes, uh, or how he describes hunting it is, or how he encapsulated it was to say, hunting is a place where you get really fucking good at being goddamn uncomfortable. Yeah, well, and I would say that is true for everything in life that's worth yes. getting good at. So, for instance, uh, um, I don't know. Give me an area, and I can tell you where it's uncomfortable. Like. I'll just start off with when I was a kid playing chess. Whether you're a chess master or a beginner, you're going to probably <laughs> lose as many games as you win. It's probably always going to be 50% of the games you win and 50% mm. of the games you lose. Because as you rise up, you play better players. So it should be the case. You know, there's only small periods where you're winning most of your games. That's when you're... You keep seeking out the loss so you can grow. Yeah. So, so... So, but you have, yeah, you have to have the loss. So then you study the games and you learn from them 
and you learn where you made mistakes and that's how you grow. A, a lot of times people stay at the same level because they never study their losses and they never grow. So that's the same thing that happens in science. You do an experiment, it doesn't work. You study why it didn't work. You, you reconstruct the experiment, you try it again, you see what happens. Or with comedy, you go up on stage, you tell a joke, if people laugh, or if people don't laugh, you look at the video afterwards. You always videotape everything. I like when Pete, when you saw me in in Venice last week, I videotaped my performance. I studied it afterwards. How long did you do? And you tried to improve. I did uh, thirteen okay. minutes. Thirteen minutes and thirteen seconds. Mm-hmm. So I know because of the video, and I said the word um a little too much in the beginning. Uh, which, you know, probably because it was a new kind of audience for me and I was maybe a little nervous, but overall it doesn't seem like people noticed it that much, but I noticed it. And, and, and again, like you, you, you know, going on stage in front of a brand new audience, so there was about 200 people there and I was a little nervous. I was, I was scared. And it was, I, people always told me California audiences are different than New York audiences. I had never experienced that was before. It true? So I always... Yeah, I think it's true. I, for one thing, that particular audience was like a home audience. Like it was people who lived in the area. Yeah. So when I perform in New York City often, it's tourists in the audience. And there were probably no tourists in that <laughs> audience. So that's a different kind of feeling. Also, I do think California comedians are a little different than New York City comedians. Yeah. I think they're more... Um, they have very observant... Uh, they're, they're very good at observing and having good opinions... They're not necessarily, this may or may not be true. So, so, you know, I don't see as many punchlines in comedians there and I don't know why. Um, but New York city might be, the punchlines might be trite, but they're punchlines. So, and not as observant. So there was subtle differences I felt between New York and California. Uh, it could be because In New York, there's more late night TV shows being filmed here. So people are preparing their five minutes for late night TV. And in California, there's more acting. So people are more preparing their their next acting gig. Yeah, exactly. So, so who knows what makes the differences and, and who knows if my analysis is accurate. This is only the first time I was observing this, but that's something to, to test and experiment with. But I, I enjoy kind of that, that process of, uh, really figuring out what it means. What's the difference between, you know, good performance and bad performance? What's the what are what what does it mean <laughs> su- it, for success in every industry? So, for instance, if you are an investor, success is measured by money. If you're a writer, though, is success measured by money? Is it success measured by book reviews? Is success measured by impact? If you're same thing with podcasts. Uh, and then, and then once you under, once you kind of define for yourself, what does performance mean and how do you measure it and what does success mean and how do you measure it? And, and the two things are different, right? So you look at an area like running. Okay. This episode of the break it down show is brought to you by lions rock productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate and develop podcasts just like this one. Consult others to build their own and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete a. Turner or at John LG 69 at the break it down show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Right? So you look at an area like running, okay? It's very easy to measure performance. Uh, Usain Bolt is measured exactly by how fast he could run 40 meters. Uh, But the person who comes in second is only 0.1 second behind him. One-tenth of a second behind him is the number two person always in any race that Usain Bolt wins. And yet Usain Bolt probably, in terms of success, he probably makes 10, 20 million a year in endorsements. Number two, probably makes yeah. zero. So so success is, and again, depending on how you measure it, success is very different from performance. And, how you, and, and, and you have to kind of decide in, in a reinvention how you're going to, what are you going for? What do you, how are you maximizing these different things and, and, and how do you define them? And then, and then once you define them, how do you, how do you achieve 
uh, your performance metrics and how do you move up in your success metrics? You may not want to have financial success. You may just want to be the best runner you know how to be, the best comedian you know how to be. And, 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 and that might not be what the world wants to reward at that time. So it's very interesting for me to study that. And then, you know, I, and I'll, I'll think about stand-up comedy for a second. Or let's say a game like poker. A lot of people will start, you know, from poker and they want to get great because you can make money at it. It, it. You don't have to work at a job. It's You make your own hours, whatever. Uh, you know, what I like to study is when can I borrow from other things, from other areas which I've mastered to get good at something new. So, for instance, you know, John, you, you're, you're, you've been a private investigator. Let's say now you want to be good at poker. There's probably some skills you've learned from being a private investigator that will help with learning Identifying poker. Identifying tells and, what and I, stuff like what that, I, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and what I call that is you've put in your 10,000 hours of being a private investigator or, or your 3,000 hours or your 5,000 hours, and now you can borrow some of those hours and put them into the poker bucket. And learning how to do that, I think, is an interesting skill. So, that, again, that's a meta learning. Well, I was going to ask you uh, how, how your frame of reference has changed because, you know, if you go to film school, let's say, and you do change careers at some point, you're going to relate your things that you learn in the new thing to the old thing. Like you said, you're, you've got a level of mastery at something. You're going to, just in the learning process, relate new things to that just so you can put it in a framework. How often do you find yourself going back to your computer science framework or have you done enough things now that it's far in the rearview mirror and you don't, you don't fall back into that because you've learned so many new skills? Which one is it? Well, I think, I think again, the primary skill is, is, is the skill of reinvention, is the skill of learning how to learn. And I think that's the same whether from chess to computer programming to making a TV show to making a podcast to, to being great at poker or stand-up comedy or business or investing. There's this meta skill which applies to all of those things, which is learning how to learn. Anything worth learning kind of falls under this category of it's difficult and I need to get good at learning in order to get good at learning X, whatever uh -huh. X is. And so the way I got good at computer programming is the same way I get good at anything now. And I, th I feel like yeah. I get better and better at learning how to learn. So what happens is, you know, they say th th there's this 10,000 hour rule where you uh, supposedly have to spend 10,000 hours to achieve uh, peak mastery in an area. And I think what I've gotten, what I try to get good at is reducing those 10,000 hours as much as possible because I don't want to spend 10,000 <laughs> hours now learning new things. Uh, I, want to, I want to speed up the process. And I think I'm really good at speeding up the process now, for, knock, knocking on wood. Not with everything, but with the things yeah. that I love doing. Those 10,000 hours, right? They're hard earned. And, and if we were to look at what 10,000 hours is, that's a 40 hour a week job for five years to get to yeah. that point. Yeah. So, you know, like to actually put 40 hours a week into learning anything is a significant investment. Um, how fast can you learn something, do you think? I think you can learn. I think if you've done it once, I think you can learn something related in. To, to and achieve the same level in like let's say one to two thousand hours and depending on how closely related pro probably less than three or four thousand hours so for instance uh let's say i put in the ten thousand hours of chess and i'm a master level player now i want to play backgammon well those are two related they're, they're related they're, they're games they're one-on-one -on -one games and uh you know poker's related as well and I didn't have to put in as many hours to achieve the same level. Maybe I had to put in, you know, 2,000 hours. For comedy, it's a little bit related to public speaking, and it's a little bit related to writing. So I borrowed from my hours of writing and right. from my hours of comedy and from my hours spent doing a podcast and from my hours spent um, going on different TV shows. And, you know, I'm still in the process of, of learning, obviously, but, you know, I would say I've put in 
couple thousand hours now and I'm starting to reach a point where I'm I'm happy with it. Like I still want to I there's still much much room for improvement. I mean the more you learn, the more you realize you need to improve. I think that's also a truism for anything worth learning. I think even the world chess champion sees more than anybody how much they have to learn to improve. And uh, uh so so but I'm getting to a level where I feel it's it's a little harder to tell the difference between me and a professional on the stage for like a 15 minute set. So, you know, I'm getting better and better at it because I'm, I'm able to quickly borrow these hours. And I've, I've, I think about this a lot. Like I love the science of learning. So Anders Ericsson, he's a professor from um, Florida who came up with the 10,000 hour rule. I've actually, corresp- he's been on my podcast. I've corresponded with him about comedy and about this idea I have about um, borrowing from other 10,000 hours and using that to truncate you know, the process in order to get good. Yeah. And then also I like reframing <laughs> it as not 10,000 hours, but maybe 10,000 experiments. So, right. you know, the other, a couple of weeks ago I had an opportunity to perform on the same stage as one of my favorite comedians. And I was given the choice. Do you want to go before him or do you want to go <laughs> after Who him? was it? First of now, all, now before him, who was it? Hmm. Oh, uh, T.J. Yeah. Miller. He played Ehrlich Bachman on Silicon Valley. He's in Deadpool, and I really like the his style. He's a he's good at improvisation. He's good, he's got good material. He's good at being very physical on stage. Uh, he he he's good at re- committing to the joke, even if the joke is not quite working. He'll commit harder and harder to the joke. <laughs> so, um, I I I I like his his style. So. I was given the choice. Do you want to go before him, which would be easy because the crowd wouldn't yet know uh-huh. that he was coming on the stage, or do I want to go immediately <laughs> after yeah. him? And I was scared to death to go immediately after him because the crowd would still be buzzing. You know, he, we just watched this great comedian, and then there's yep. me. And uh, so, of course, I chose to go immediately right. after him because, because your balls are in. That would be the enormous. only way I would improve. Right from that set and is giving myself that challenge. So I always take, it's never about that one set. I'm never trying to do like the best in that one set. I'm trying to always improve. And so take the harder choice each time. Not so hard you can't do it, yeah. but hard enough that it's a challenge and that you're afraid. Always push yourself so that you're a little bit afraid. Uh, like if someone said to me, do you want to be the passenger of the plane or do you want to be the pilot? <laughs> I'm never going to say be the pilot because then the right. plane would crash. But if someone said, you know, you want to be on a plane where there's a little bit more turbulence, sure, I'll take Andy, that. And you want to maybe sit in the faster. co-pilot seat and learn a new something and take the yoke at some point during that flight. That's that's the one that you choose. I right? probably wouldn't want to do that either. <laughs> well, <laughs> I still don't want to risk the plane so crashing. But it, um, you know, one of the things yeah, though that you point out is the perfect uh, is a perfect reflection of J- Jay Leno. And he always says that he got good because he would go to the comedy store on Sunday nights and he would go right after Richard Pryor. And Richard Pryor would slay yeah. the place. And then he would get up and he would tell 10 jokes and he would find out that the 10 jokes that he thought were great, six of them were not that great. Yeah. And think about that. Like Richard Pryor, their styles are yep. very different. Um Richard Pryor, he's telling these very honest, heart-wrenching stories growing up, you know, with prostitutes and what was yeah. like that like. And Jay Leno, uh, you know, and growing up in all the difficult situations he grew up in, Jay Leno is very much like, like, you know, premise, punchline, premise, uh-huh. punchline. You never know anything about his personal life at all from his stand-up. And... Uh, so he gave himself a very great challenge and, and, and that's how he became, I mean, whether you like him or not, he's clearly one of the best in the world. So, and he, he proved it doing it for, I don't know, God knows how many years is the tonight yep. show host. And so, well, so how did you do uh, after TJ Miller? I did very good. And what I realized was I was able to b- almost borrow from his energy on the stage and take it with me into uh-huh. my set. So, so I learned a new thing that I didn't know before, which is that that was possible. And, uh, uh, so that was, that was of comfort. And, and then I was able to stick to my own voice just like Jay Leno did. And, and, 
you know, it was an audience downtown on Wall Street. Actually, it was a club down on Wall Street in New York City. And I found that was my crowd more than anybody else's crowd that was going up that night. So I was able to play off of that a little bit. And so so I did I did good. Uh, I had a similar experience happen uh, two weeks ago. Bill Burr went on oh, right cool. before me. Wow. And Bill Burr is one of the. <laughs> Yeah, Bill Burr is one of the greatest ever. And he had so much energy and so much presence on stage that I was like, I was terrified. I was like, oh, my God, how am I going to follow yeah. this guy? And yet I was able to do it. I, I, I did the technique of playing off of his energy a little bit. And I wasn't as observational as him. He was very observational and up to date. But I was I did my own thing and it was. It was fine. I feel like I did very well. And in fact, I did well enough that they were the owners of that club were surprised and invited me That's back. That's great. Well, so, for our listeners who are yeah. out there going, I would never in a million years do that. I think the lesson here is you had a room full of people. Uh, Bill Burr and in, and, and in TJ's case, TJ Miller went in and they killed the room. But it turns out that there were a bunch of people there who still wanted to laugh some more. And you were able to yeah. deliver them some more laughs. Right, like they're they're there to laugh, right. the audience, and everybody was afraid. Like, oh my gosh, Bill Burr, I can't go on after him. He's gonna he's gonna kill the room. Um, but no, the audience wants to laugh, and if you just if you just stay in the moment and 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 you know you're having fun, then uh, you could you could win in those environments. But it was something I had to learn because I've definitely been in situations where I followed a great comedian and then I completely died. Like a couple of years ago, I followed Judah Friedlander, who's he's in the yeah. show Thirty Rock, and very good com- very good stand up. Most people don't know he's a very good stand up comedian, and he he destroyed, meaning he did very good. And I just could not figure out how to follow him, and I completely died. And uh, n- now I think I could probably do that a little better. But all this is kind of related to other things. Like we're focusing on comedy, but it's also related to investing. It's related to entrepreneurship. It's all the same kind of meta skills, um, putting yourself in difficult situations, but not too difficult. And like, you don't want to get in, in uh, being an entrepreneur, you don't want to get into a situation where you have a payroll to make and, oh, let's take it right up into the last second and get a client who makes, helps us make payroll. Like you don't want to take, you want to take calculated risks, not stupid risks. And you want to take the sort of risks that keep you in the game and help you learn. So Following Bill Burr on a comedy lineup is not going to take me out of the game. Even if I completely bomb, it's not going to take me out of the game. Even if I bomb, I'm still going to learn. Even better, the video. uh, You know, I've been known to grab an open mic myself uh, recently, and good for you. You, you, it's a badge of honor to go. I remember I was in. uh, We had a comedy club here in San Francisco, and um, it was called Brainwashed, and it was a comedy club and a laundromat. And I remember going up there and I didn't do all that great. I was just kind of fumbling around and I'm thinking to myself while I'm up there, um, because I listen to a lot of comedy podcasts too. Hey, I'm up here eating a bag of dicks, uh, as the saying goes. And I thought, this is great. (laughs) And it was fun. And, uh, Louis, Louis CK uses that phrase in, in one of his jokes in, uh, uh, a special from 2009, uh, where he analyzes, like, what does that actually mean, a bag of dicks? <laughs> and it's very funny. But, yeah, and an open mic is a different kind of challenge. In an open mic, the audience is mostly other c- people who want to Yeah, they're waiting comedians. to get their time on the list as well. So, <laughs> uh-huh. And they're scared. So they're not really there to laugh. As opposed to, like, a normal comedy night, the audience is not there to laugh. They're there to go on stage. So it's very hard to get laughs in an open mic. So you might have you you feel like you're bombing. You might not be bombing at all. You don't know in an open mic. And an open mic is a different kind of challenge. Like you sort of decide in advance, what is my challenge here? Am I going to try to make them laugh? Am I trying to work on material? How will I judge the material if it's good or not? Am I just practicing stage presence? How will I judge if it's good or not? So it's a it's a different kind of challenge an open mic than well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take those as encouraging words, but let's flip back over as you started to do to the world of investing. What's the equivalent in investing? Because every time you, you, know, you uh, eat that bag of dicks as an investor, you're losing money. 
does it yeah. feel the same? Yeah, it's horrible. It's when you're horrible. taking a loss and, like, and, and, yet, and learning a lesson. Well, and not you're not only taking a loss, you're taking a loss with other people's money if you're a professional investor. Not only your own money, but mm-hmm. other people's money. You know, I was a hedge fund manager, so I invested not only my own money, but the money of my investors. And so when you lose money, it's it's the worst feeling in the world. So why does anybody do it? Because well, A, it's potentially lucrative. It's not necessarily lucrative. It's like any other job. And I loved investing. I, I wa- it was a skill I wanted to learn. Now, again, anytime there's a skill you love learning, it doesn't mean you're going to be happy all the time. It should mean that you suck most of the time and you're getting better. Now, you don't want to suck while you're investing other people's money, but even the best investors in the world had bad years last year. Uh, you know, I can name a handful of people who had, you know, negative or horrible returns last year. And there, there's many examples of this all the time. Like, you know, I, Warren Buffett's partner, Charlie Munger, he had he, he he was a professional investor in 1973 and 74. And I think he was down 20 percent each of those years, his first two years as a professional investor, investing other people's money. He just sucked at it. And then he finally made back to even in 1975, 76. I think those were the years. And he gave them, he decided that's it for me. And he gave all the money back. But he learned a lot. And, you know, he's been very successful as the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway for the past 50 years or 40 years. And uh, as a result, he's a billionaire. Uh, so, again, he learned yeah. skills that he was able to bring into another area a very closely related area, which was investing the money of an insurance company. And, and he was, and also advising, he was a great advisor to a very successful investor, Warren Buffett. And so he, he brought his skills that he learned as a professional investor into these very closely related skills. And he became very successful at that. So, uh, you know, again, losing money is, is, it feels horrible because you, 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 they actually measure it. Your, 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 every one of your chemicals that are related to happiness goes down and your libido goes down, everything. You feel like, you know, horrible. But again, losing is a great way to, to learn. I've, I've made so many bad investments and each and every one of them, I would say I've learned from. Whereas I probably haven't learned as much from good investments. Maybe I've learned once from good investments. Ah, this is why this investment was good. Just repeat this. And then I've learned a lot from the bad investments. Like, huh, I didn't do what I was doing. And the good one, I, I made this mistake, this mistake, this mistake. And I've learned a lot from the it bad investments. It forces you to dig into more detail. Um, I want to remind our listeners, yeah. jamesaltucher.com, go there. There's plenty of stuff, blog posts. Listen to the James Altucher show. I, have, I do have a question. We are talking about this 10,000 hours thing and bowering hours. You have the, uh, and we do too, the luxury of talking to great people like you've had Gilbert Gottfried on and, and it recently had Evan Carmichael on. All these people, I would imagine, give you the ability. You've talked about in the comedy part about the early hours, like learning about crowds and observational and, and the different types of comedy. And so you can bring some of those hours and transplant them early on on the ramp as you go up. But when you talk to these experts, people that mentor billionaires and all these things, you must be getting some of the hours from the very end of the ramp that are given back to you where the the end of the ramp is brought to you a little bit. Like Jay Moore talks about working the crowd in front of the mic before you ever even tell a joke. So absolutely like uh, with investing, you know, I've talked to some of the best investors in the world on my podcast or with, uh, I don't know, with achieving any kind of peak performance I've had on, Tony Hawk, who was world champion skateboarder 11 years in a row. I've had on Gary Kasparov, who was the world chess champion for 20 years. I've had on Tyra Banks, who's in her 30th season of America's Next Top Model. You know, she's peak performer in, in several areas of life. I've had on Judy Bloom, who sold over 100 million copies of her books. Richard Branson, Ray Dalio, like all these, all these amazing people. So with comedians and comedy, if something bad happened to me the night before... I'll just ask the question, like, let's say, hypothetically, (laughs) X, Y, Z happens to you on the stage. What would you do? I've had enormous benefit by talking to the best people in the world at what they do and how they've overcome various hurdles. 
uh, along the way because they've all had hurdles along the way. Would you believe Tyra Banks, um, she, when she came up with the idea for America's Next Top Model, she, she went to her agent and she said, I'm the best model in the world right now or close to it. And American Idol is the best show, the highest rated show out there right now. How about we combine the two? And the agent was like, nah, that sounds like a bad idea. And she had to switch agents and really pursue this idea that is, in retrospect, is such a no brainer. Right. And now she's in her 30th season, you know, but she had to basically say he's wrong and I'm not going to let this dissuade me. And, you know, as someone who just like Pete, when you yeah. saw me in L.A., I was spending my days pitching a TV show. It's very easy to get dissuaded by the so-called yeah. experts. And that's a that's a natural thing to be dissuaded by the experts and, and to feel discouraged uh, uh, and even depressed by their reactions in some cases. But you have to get through that. And say, well, where was where were they right? Where were they wrong? And do I want to do I believe in this enough that I want to push it forward? And if so, do I change it? And Tyra Banks did all that and succeeded. And same thing for Sarah Blakely, who I've interviewed. Um, she's worth about five billion dollars. She created Spanx. Took her eight years to find even the first bit of success after she had the idea. And it was just persistence. You know, part of it is persistence. Part of it is networking. Part of it is how good are your skills. Uh, part of it is luck. And you have to kind of mesh all that together to have a winning formula. One of the attitudes that uh, I, I think I learned from Pete is that 100 years from now, it's likely that nobody's going to give shit. So, you know, right. as we attempt these things, as we endure these failures as we go into these uncomfortable situations hey maybe we get lucky and we run into a home run and a hundred years from now somebody cares about some minuscule part of something that we did and great that's terrific but ultimately the likelihood is that this place is going to be you know it's still going to exist a hundred years from now and we will be dust floating around somewhere else so yeah well it's funny you mention that because i i a few months ago, in one of my stand-up performances, I was making a joke about uh, one of my daughters wanted to find her passion, or, or her, no, not her passion, her purpose in life. And I was like, "Who told you you had a purpose?" <laughs> because, like, let like I I and then I asked the audience, and and by the way, I'm not asking you guys. Because no one, no one knew the answer. I asked a question to the audience that nobody, it was about 120 people in the audience, nobody knew the answer. And the question was, who was president of the United States right before Abraham Lincoln? So arguably, one of the most important presidents <laughs> ever because he's the president that kind of caused the Civil James War. James Buchanan. Like, <laughs> James Buchanan, correct. Uh, uh, but nobody in the, in the audience knew the answer. One person actually shouted out, George Washington. <laughs> and that was the only person who, who, who dared to yeah, answer. Yeah. But but like but think about it. When James Buchanan was a little boy, he said what every other little boy was saying, When I grow up, I'm gonna be president of the United States. And he actually was the one person out of fifty million people who achieved his dreams and and became president of one of the most important country. He was one of the most important people on the planet. And not only that, he he kind of caused the worst war in U.S. history as measured by percentage of U.S. citizen deaths. And yet not a single person in the audience knew who he was. So you're right. It's <laughs> like it doesn't really matter. Like everyone is like, oh, what, what kind of effect are you going to have on the world? Are you going to have positive impact on the world? Oh, it's great to have positive impact on the world. I'm not saying don't have don't be good to people. Don't have positive impact. But don't fool yourself into thinking people are going to remember you nobody's going to remember. You're right. And so you have to really do it ultimately for yourself, not in a selfish way, but if you want to have the greatest impact, make sure you're having the impact on you first or else you've just wasted your life. If you're always doing for others and you're perpetually unhappy in the hopes that a hundred years from now, someone's going to remember you, you just wasted your life. So in addition to the James Altucher show, which everybody should listen to and subscribe to and all that stuff, you've got 400 plus episodes on that show and they're, and they're all terrific. Uh, and you've named many of your guests, but you also had 
Uh, let's see. You had a show called Ask Altger, and you had a show called Question of the Day that you did with Stephen Dubner. And those were great shows, and I'm sorry that those shows haven't endured. Can I ask why? What makes you cut them off? Or, or is it simply that, you know, you don't have time and, and it just didn't work out? Well, okay, like Question of the Day is a great example. Question of the Day uh, I did with Stephen Dubner, as you mentioned. He's, he's the co-author of Freakonomics. And we would kind of look for interesting questions on Twitter or, or Quora or wherever. And we would ask them to each other and discuss them. And I don't know, we did a couple hundred episodes of that. The, the downloads were great. Every single episode was getting a, a ton of downloads, like just as much as, as the James Altucher show is now. And we were making money from it, actually, because our costs weren't very high. And uh, uh, like we didn't have to deal with, you know, guests and, yeah. and so on. So it made it a little easier to schedule. And uh, uh, but it wasn't growing and it was sort of plateauing the number of downloads. And it just didn't feel that great to uh, to just stay the same all the time. And we didn't and we didn't feel like we were growing. We ended up asking like I remember one time we started off an episode and I asked a question and the audio producer, uh, you know, said through the headphones, oh, James, you asked that, you know, 25 episodes <laughs> ago. And then I posed another question and Nathan, the audio producer, said, oh, James, you, you asked that already. I asked another question. Nathan's like, sorry, James, you already asked that one. I asked an, I, with this one on like wow. nine times. I had asked. I didn't even remember I'd asked these questions. And so we just weren't really growing in the right way. And I just, I mean, Stephen and I are great friends. We just played backgammon together the day before yesterday or, or maybe yesterday, I forget. But uh, uh, I just didn't feel like, like it was growing and it was taking time away from my show. And for him, it was taking away time from the Freakonomics show and it was taking time away from my writing. Uh, so... It's stuff like that. When you feel like you're kind of plateauing and not really growing and you don't really know how to grow, maybe it's time to take a step back. We might do a reunion show on my show just for the fun of it. Uh, it was Sometimes you just get this feeling like I'm not really, I'm not really regaining by this. No one else is really growing from it anymore because we're just talking about the same issues. And that was that. Well, from your listener base, I will say, speaking for all of us, um, it's fun being a fly on the wall while you guys just bullshit. So whenever you want to do that reunion show, there's there's value in it for for our. Well, ears. you know what you know what we're doing, and I think we started this. Well, I think we started yesterday. Is that right, Jay? We started. Yesterday. Did we release the show with just me and Steve yesterday? So with my podcast producer Steve Cohen, we decided half our shows now will be with guests, and those are always great. I just I love the guests, uh, and half the shows will be me ranting on an issue. Or, or this, rather, I should say, discussing an issue with my podcast producer, who's a very intelligent guy. That has more of a feel of like question of the day or ask yeah. Altucher. And that's a lot of fun because I feel like I could take my new skills from comedy and kind of borrow from those skills now into podcasting and see how I've improved on that kind of format of me discussing an important issue to, my, to myself. Terrific. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, then that that begs the question. I think we just I think we just released the first one of yeah. those yesterday, and so it was fun. It's different in that you do get to a point where there's a little better shorthand and there's a little more familiarity. And I ask this because we have several repeat guests who come on, you know, a year later, and uh, and it we just had Jordan Harbinger on for the second time after he's done his new show for a year. And it was neat to go back and reflect, and it was a different conversation because we know each other. Um, yeah, no, there's a saying, um, your best new customers or your yeah. old customers. I love it when when I have a guest that I have a lot of rapport with and a lot of chemistry with, and Jordan Harbinger is one of those. Uh, uh, I've had on AJ Jacobs quite a bit. Uh, he's written a bunch of best-selling books. I've had on Tucker Max quite a bit. Brian Koppelman, who is the creator of Billions, he's been on like about four or five times. Uh, uh, Amy Morin, who wrote the book uh, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. She's been on maybe six times. I love having on repeat guests. And that is my question. We'll see you this time next year. <laughs> yeah, Terrific. of course. Hey, be uh, and, and before we close up, because we're running into your hour here, um, thanks for telling the Byron Allen story. Oh, you mean... I, I, 
That was such, a, I would say that is one of my, people always ask me, who are your favorite guests? And I don't really know who the favorite guest is. It's a hard question to answer. And obviously you don't want sure. to insult yeah. guests who you don't, who you forget about. Yeah, there are many and, and it depends what day you ask and what you, you, you but, recall. But I loved that episode because it was combined so many of my interests, like comedy and entrepreneurship and investing. And it, Byron is so- Tenacity. It, yeah. And- you know, bootstrapping and all of everything. I, I learned yeah. so much from that podcast with Byron Allen. I'm I'm in there. I'm not a journalist, right? And 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 we're all doing this podcasting thing, not to just expose something, but to uh, uh, to learn. And and I I learned so much from Byron Allen that day. He had such a great story. Well, hey man, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. You are, of course, you delivered as we imagined you would, but. Um, I'm uh, elated that you will come back and we will keep following you and we'll even do more inside stuff because we're going to continue to consume. For our audience, uh, once again, jamesaltucher.com where you can start off uh, seeing everything and you can just spider out from there. And you can read well, thank, and Thanks so much and, for having me on the show. I, I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm so grateful that you guys asked me. James thank Altucher, you. everybody. 